All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast getting closer by the hour, closer by the day to the other side of this quarantine. And as things continue to open up around Columbia and around the country, I say Columbia because that's where the three of us are, uh, around Columbia and around the country, it it feels like things are getting a little bit more back to normal. And this podcast is going to feel a little bit more like a normal May 20th podcast of any other year. We have a ton of football to get to today. Lots of recruiting notes. Um, I, I guess that we have so many recruiting notes for the class of 2021 this early in the year is maybe a little bit unusual, but a lot of football to talk today. Will Muschamp has uh, made several comments about his team in the last uh, week or so since we last podcasted, which I guess was last Thursday. So a lot of football things to get to today. But Wes, Chris, uh, y'all both mentioned to me just before the podcast that as things starting to open up, not going crazy but, you know, maybe starting to resume some life as normal activities, including uh, even going out to a restaurant for the first time in two months. Right, Chris? That's right. You know, just a little outdoor uh, experience the other day with the family. First time in a while. It was a little bit weird, to be honest. Um, and uh, the waiter was uh, masked up, gloved up. and But, you know, we were outdoors, and it was really nice. And, uh, you know, for the most part, people weren't hanging around there was a big group that came up that was sort of just threw caution to the wind and were milling all around and they had to be uh i guess you could say they had to be escorted to a uh, uh you know more isolated situation <laughs> <laughs> away from everybody else but it was good and it, it was nice to you know get outside and, and go out to eat and everything uh but we're still for the most part probably going to be still confined you know in yeah i, I guess for people that are kind of getting back out there, though, it's it's like nice to know that you have the option because that was that was the hardest part. You know, I, I didn't go out to eat a ton before. You know, I, usually I would try to limit myself to like a couple times a week at most. Like I wouldn't eat out more than two or three times a week. Um, you know, just for for a lot of different reasons. But not having the option was like more crippling than actually not eating out for me. Um, but just some of the other things, um, you know, like going on vacations, going to the grocery store, things like that. Uh, and, and Wes, you uh, you said y'all made a a day trip this past weekend. Yeah, we uh, we just went down to Folly Beach for the day and we literally went and sat on the beach, uh, my girlfriend and I, just hanging out away from people. And it really wasn't – I would say that there were a lot of people in Folly Beach, uh, but uh, everybody was, was spread out, man. I mean, it wasn't really – wasn't really anything crazy to it. I, I know you've seen um, – you know, you've seen some, some news stories where some various beaches, people are just all packed in on each other mm-hmm. and – uh, but Folly was really nice, man. It was uh, the weather was good, and uh, everybody was sort of spread out. Um, you know, I've eaten. We ate once down there, and it was outdoor eating. I actually ate at Cantina, and we ended up inside. But everybody was all spread out, mm-hmm. so um, that's the only two. I think that's the only two meals we've had out and about um, mm-hmm. since all this happened. Yeah, it feels good though. I haven't yet been back out to eat, but I'm just like really encouraged and happy that other people have done it. I'm just like living vicariously through y'all and uh, through the Kimrys. Obviously, Eric Kimry, who I do my local show, I'm on a seven five the game with. They went out. They went somewhere last week, and he's going on vacation next week. And it just it feels good for things to be getting a little bit more uh, back to normal. But um, uh, like y'all are doing, hope everyone for those of you that are kind of starting to resume some of those life as usual activities are continuing to do so safely and uh, you know just mindful of. Everything that can go wrong if we uh, if we get this sort of slow reentry into society wrong. But uh, anyway, just generally encouraged to have that kind of stuff to talk about. And uh, plenty of football as well. It seems like the football season, at least for most of the SEC schools, everybody except for Vanderbilt at this point, they are planning on having a business-as-usual kind of season other than, again, maybe like a shortened preseason, which leads to some sloppy games early in the season. But I think people are planning and hoping for – a season to start as usual, September 5th for, you know, most of the schools around the country. And so now the question is, you know, what do you do getting guys back on campus? Uh, will Muschamp has given some thoughts on that uh, and here in the last couple of days that we'll uh, continue to break down. And, uh, you know, of course, as we get more updates from, from everybody, we'll continue to break those things down. But want to start today with a little bit of recruiting. Uh, we spent a lot of time on a handful of guys the last week and just wanted to get some quick updates on, uh, I guess, three of the guys that we talked about last week. And we will start uh, with you, Wes, and uh, J.J. Jones. Not a huge update. He hasn't uh, made any official decision in terms of schools, but he has at least decided when he's going to announce this initial commitment. Yeah, you know, when we talked last week, uh, J.J. Jones had said he was going to commit, uh, you know, within a week or so. So that would be obviously this week as we're recording the podcast. And um, J.J. has now decided to, 
announce on this Friday. And, you know, I think we thought it was probably in this direction last week, but it, but ever since then we've gotten more confirmation that this looks more and more like North Carolina. Um, you know, I, I think South Carolina was probably the, the biggest competition there for, you know, for the Tar Heels. But, but right now um, I, I'd be pretty surprised if it isn't UNC on Friday. Now, I do think he's one we will continue to track. Uh, you know, I think South Carolina will stay in there on him. I think there will, uh, you know, be the potential for him to maybe visit campus again down the road once things open up again, and he's a guy to at least keep an eye on. But, but yeah, I, I think it's probably going to be North Carolina on Friday. Yeah, we spent most of last week talking about just how weird this recruiting cycle it like has been and is probably going to end up being historically with a lot of early commits and anticipating a lot of decommits and recruitment still being open for a lot of guys despite making those early commitments and uh sounds like uh, putting jj jones firmly in that category of someone that's just getting it in while things are still shut down and and surely sub uh subject to change um, but we are recording this wednesday morning and just in about two days we will be expected uh to hear jj jones making his decision and it's probably going to be north carolina um, so there you go. There's the update on that. Don't get your don't get your hopes up. Uh, the other update, uh, another guy that was expected to make his decision over the weekend, I think on Sunday, is uh, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins. And Chris, he has actually since tabled his decision. Um, as things uh, are continuing to get back to normal, I, I wonder if we'll see uh, again this trend of a lot of guys committing really, really early in the process, starting to slow down. As it seems like there may be a little more optimism that they can get on campuses and, and sort of go through a a more normal recruiting cycle? Because, again, this is, I mean, this is the class of 2021, so we're still a long way away uh, from these guys playing their college football and you know, even a ways away from them playing their final high school season. Uh, but Tyron Ingram Dawkins, Chris, has tabled his decision. Is that good or bad news for Carolina or neutral? Um, you know, I, I think that's been a little bit difficult to get a handle on. I would say neutral because I don't want to, you know, give a non-answer. Um, depending on you know, who you're talking to, because there have been some different uh, opinions on it. You know, I think South Carolina had a really good shot had he went ahead and decided on Sunday. But um, this is one of those where a few different schools have been in the mix. The thought is that South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia have been the biggest players to varying degrees. Tennessee actually had a good level of confidence that it was going to be the Vols if he would have picked on Sunday. South Carolina, you know, from what we've heard from multiple sides also seemed to have a really good shot. I, I'm more inclined to think he was going to pick South Carolina, but I, I just can't be 100% sure. What I do know is once he announced that he was going to announce on Sunday, um, he got hit up by a lot of coaches, obviously had a lot of media inquiries, and I think it sort of threw a wrench in things. And for someone like Ingram Dawkins, who is really – sort of dove head first in the recruiting process. He's been very active on social media, et cetera. Um, I think that that created even more confusion. So here's what we do know, Pearson, is that it really, I don't want to say it didn't matter at all which school we committed to, because it, it does matter. But had he committed to South Carolina, I don't think this recruitment would have been over. Had he committed to Tennessee or even Georgia, I mean, that there were some indications Georgia was in there too. I don't think it would be over. And I think had he committed to Tennessee or Georgia, you know, he would have been back on campus at South Carolina very early in the process. And I think I think in the long haul, you look at who has the best shot. And as long as South Carolina is stable, uh, the coaching staff is stable, et cetera, I think they're going to have the best shot, you know, in terms of the long haul. Just making the in-state pitch to him. He's got a good relationship with the staff. He's been prioritized. Um, so I, I think the timing of it, is fairly neutral, and I say that because no matter where he would have committed, had it been South Carolina or elsewhere, I think this is a process that would have continued on. So is there any indication uh, when to expect a decision there, or is it just are, are people not trying to, to figure it out anymore because the process is probably <laughs> going to ultimately be so fluid? So I think Wes has the exact timeline on this, right? It's in June at some point, Wes? June, uh, June 26th. Yeah, so June 26th is the new date. I, I knew he had it, and I didn't have it off the top of my head. So that's the new date. And, again, I, I'll say the same thing I just said. I think it's one – I don't want to say any commitment made during this whole quarantine period is one that you really have to put an asterisk by. I, I wouldn't say that because there are certain guys 
whether it's guys committed to South Carolina or elsewhere, that I think are going to stick, you know, barring things like coaching changes at school or et cetera. But um, I, I just think whether it was back on last Sunday or if it's in June or whatever, any time before the season, before in-person recruiting opens up, I think you do – Ingram Dawkins is going to be one that you have to keep an eye on, I think, just because he has been. I, I think he'll continue to communicate with coaches. I think he may go take some other visits. Now, could he prove me wrong on that in terms of the visits and stuff? Possibly, but that's, I'm just going by what we've, we've seen and observed so far. But, yeah, June 26th is, is the new date to watch in terms of committing. He just wanted to take some more time to try to be a little bit more sure before he went ahead and went public with the decision. All right, sounds fair to me, just about a month from when we are recording this. Uh, the last guy that we talked about last week that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is uh, Zaire Patterson. Uh, I don't know why I – said it like there was an apostrophe in the middle of his name. It's just Zaire Patterson. It's not Zaire Patterson, just Zaire Patterson. Uh, Wes, what's the update on Zaire Patterson? Yeah, you know, this one's been really interesting to follow, and I, I think um, Chris was, was sort of all on it last week when the buzz started to sort of be there that this may be more of a Palmetto State battle. I, I know if you've read online um, the last few weeks, there was maybe some thought that, that UNC was, was gaining some traction, but um, it was starting to look like South Carolina and Clemson. And now I, I think that suspicion and that info has sort of been confirmed as, um, you know, we, we've sort of dug in on this one. I, I think you look at him, it, it's going to be hard, I think. And, and Chris can pop in on this one as well. He's been a little more, he's been closer to this one than I have, but um, the decision is May 26th. So that's next Tuesday. So you're looking at just under a week until the announcement. Um, I, I think, you know, we're certainly going to try to dig on it and see what's out there. I, I think this is going to be one of those that's going to be maybe difficult to know until he actually makes the decision. Some guys, you know, information is fairly easy to come by, and, and some guys uh, just do a really good job of, of keeping things in their camp quiet. And uh, Zaire has, has sort of fallen in that second category. And, um I think I think it's one of those schools, but Chris, uh, I, I mean, at least right now, the, can can you give South Carolina or Clemson an edge as far as the information goes? I, I mean, like you said last week, I, I think Zaire has his mind made up. I, I, it certainly seems that way, but actually finding out which one it's going to be seems to have kind of uh, been tough to to figure out. Very much so. I definitely agree with that. You know. I think all we can do right now with confidence is, is say that it's going to be one of Clemson or South Carolina. You know, the final four was Clemson, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama. And, and as we started, you know, alluding to last week on Thursday, you know, North Carolina was not as strong as people thought. And so this is expected to be a pick between South Carolina or Clemson. Alabama is not thought to be, you know, a serious contender at this stage. So, you know, I think the timing is interesting, and and if you follow the visits, he's only been to Clemson that we know of once last season with his mom, and maybe that's enough. I mean, because Clemson, obviously, call it like it is, has a huge national profile right now. They also just lost, you know, not too long ago, Corey Foreman from California, decommitted, opened things back up. And so that put Patterson a little bit more in the crosshairs. So maybe a couple weeks after that, he goes ahead and says, hey, I'm scheduling my decision. I'm ready to commit before the season during quarantine. Now, we have seen other people do that. It's not uncommon. But I'm just saying it's interesting timing. He's been to South Carolina probably, I mean, definitely more than Clemson, but maybe he he might have been to South Carolina more than anywhere else in the process. I'm not sure, sure where North Carolina is on that, but he visited at least three times last year. You know, he was on campus back in February. He was on campus for the spring game in April. And then he was back working out with Mike Peterson at summer camp. And I think was back during the season as well for a game at least. But definitely at least three times last year. So a lot of familiarity there, a long-time target for the staff. And so, you know, the feedback that we've heard is that it's South Carolina or Clemson. So I don't discount either one. I think if you sort of go off of a vibe or just maybe trying to extrapolate info or things like that, you know, it might be hard to beat Clemson, you know, um, especially when we haven't really heard a firm indication of, hey, you know, we we think it's going to be South Carolina. All we've heard is that South Carolina is in there as one of the final two. So 
it is one where I think Wes made a great point. Sometimes you know, sometimes you, you think you know, sometimes you don't know. And so I'm really not sure on this one beyond those being the final two. You know, if you made me make a pick, I might go with Clemson just be, and it's only a projection just based on maybe timing or what makes the most sense right now, things of that nature. But but it certainly wouldn't be a surprise if it was South Carolina based on everything else. And maybe we find out a little bit more in advance to the 26. I think that is certainly possible that that things uh, come to the surface a little bit more because there's there's still some time to go before then. And we see that happen at times too, where you know we're we're trying to work a situation up until the very end, and then we eventually get some clarity. We just don't have it quite yet. There aren't a ton, and uh, Wes was on with Jamie yesterday talking about this very thing. There aren't a ton of battles that end up being South Carolina and Clemson. I think, you know, Clemson was in Jordan Birch's top five at the end, but it doesn't sound like it was necessarily part of the final decision. It was kind of LSU and South Carolina, um, you know, maybe a little bit of Georgia. What was my understanding, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but not a ton of head-to-head battles, but, you know, both having – you know the the uh, you know relative proximity to home. You know that's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Obviously, Clemson's a lot better. Um, they have a clear road to the college football playoff every year, unless it's a, a matter of playing time, or uh, you know maybe he just really wants to play in the SEC. Like I, I know y'all aren't in the room; you don't know what Will Muschamp's pitch is. But like, what what is the pitch to get someone to go to South Carolina over Clemson when he's trying to decide between those two places other than playing time? Well, I mean, I, look, I, I think it can be a variety of factors. So it really depends on the prospect. I mean, you, you look at Jordan Birch, you know, he, he was someone who he, he and his family both really liked the idea of staying close to home. And so obviously when you're talking about, you know, a family who's from Florence but still has a lot of family in the state, um, they're very, you know, it's very tight knit, very small circle with Jordan Birch. And so that, that made sense, you know, with South Carolina being close to home. There is a huge trust level with Will Muschamp. I mean, I, I've said this. I, I think without Will Muschamp, there, there might have been a coach somewhere out in the country that that could have landed Jordan Birch for South Carolina. But Will Muschamp was the key to the recruitment for Jordan Birch. If he's not in place, I think he's very probable to be playing somewhere else right now. You know, signed somewhere else. Um, the trust level there from very early on was built up to where, you know, Birch's family would, you know, his very small inner circle, that they trusted him implicitly and would even go to him for guidance during the recruiting process. And so when you can do that, there's a huge level of trust there. And that, that helps significantly because recruiting is all about relationships. And then, you know, he, he, you know, they saw the facilities and the investment, the opportunity for playing time, you know, uh, the relationships he had with some other people, you know, that, who were either going to South Carolina or already on the roster. So those are some of the things that can weigh in. And I think sometimes people put a little bit too much stock in the head to head. Now look, if you're one of the if you're one of the best programs in the country, recruiting is is not easy, but it's easier because you have, you know, winning is something that that really helps. You know, people want to play for winning organizations. But a lot of people were sort of circling the end of the year like Clemson folks are saying, Well, you know, Hey, when we beat South Carolina in November at the end of the year, that that'll be the difference maker for Jordan Birch. No, it, it was never going to be. You know, Jordan Birch was at that game. He, he was barely watching the game. You know, he was just hanging out with people. So, it, it's not always a huge factor. So, for South Carolina, I mean, look, no, they don't have the winning historical record or current record of Clemson, whether it's head to head or winning titles, whatever it may be. But they can sell a hey, development. Um, the, the chance to, to, you know, to live in Columbia, to be around that environment, the investment, the new facilities, SEC football. There's a lot of different things that they can continue to sell there, and it's just about whether they can uh, they can sell it well. And they do have a lot of things also that they have to overcome when you're when you're recruiting against Clemson and Georgia, and you've got sort of the historical background with all that. All right, one more guy uh, for each of you before we uh, move on from the class of 2021. Uh, first of all, athlete uh, Raheem Sanders. Didn't talk about him last week, but what is the latest with Raheem Sanders, someone that South Carolina has, I think to use your words, uh, Wes, has recently turned the heat up on? Yeah, you want to take this one, Chris? Yeah, so, you know, Raheem Sanders is someone that, um, you know, he's carried an offer for a while, Um uh, you know, he's from Rockledge, Florida. He's a really – he's one of the more versatile guys probably in the southeast in that 
some schools think he can play linebacker in college. Um, but really, he's sort of honed in on offense. And, and the schools that are in his final five, which those are Arkansas, Missouri, um, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and FSU, most of those have told him, hey, either we are recruiting you for offense or you can definitely play offense. And so running back or wide receiver is, is you know, he, a couple more positions he can play offensively and play well. South Carolina seems to like him as a receiver. You know, Will Muschamp and Joe Cox have both been very involved, and they've sort of turned up the heat recently. Um, you know, it's been interesting timing because back in February, you know, we ran an update on Sanders on GamecockCentral.com, and, we, you know, he'd just come off a visit to Florida State. That was the last place he got to visit before the recruiting shutdown, and he was just eyeing, hey, I want to go take a trip to South Carolina, and then all this happened. So I think for them the key is, maybe him just holding off so they can get him on campus whenever things do open back up. I think that's a key for them. But he, he is intrigued by South Carolina with the opportunity, with the staff, with their pitch. I think Florida State's a significant player uh, as an in-state program who he's got a good relationship with. They got the last visit, so they got that going for him. Uh, but South Carolina's in the mix, and, and he's a guy that, uh, that the staff seems to like a lot, and there seems to be some legitimate mutual interest there. When you have someone that's as versatile as he is, obviously you mentioned you know some people recruiting him as a linebacker, some people recruiting him as, as a wide receiver. Clearly, I mean, he's good. And if you want him as a linebacker, you want him as a linebacker. But if you just like a kid's talent, shouldn't you just be like, yeah, come play wide receiver for us, even if you don't think he's going to pan out as a wide receiver, because then you have a really good athlete on your team. And then, you know, maybe once you get him into your program, you can get him to buy in a little bit more to the other side. Not to say you should trick him or lie to him or pull the wool over his eyes, but if you value his talent and athleticism on, on one side of the ball, isn't it just worth getting a guy like that in your program? Like, I've never understood why schools won't say, oh, you want to play this? Sure, come play this for us. We just want you because we think you're a good football player. Well, that, and that does happen some. I mean, um, and sometimes coaches are up front with it, and sometimes not as much. Or sometimes you get a guy and you say, no, what, he's, he's not panning out here. Let's try him. So I think there can really be a few different paths. Um, you know, one of the schools in his Final Five was Oklahoma, you know, they, they have told Sanders, hey, that they sort of recruited him as an athlete a little bit and said, hey, if you want to play offense, let's go for it, you know, um, that they sort of want him. So some schools, I think, will take the strategy of, hey, we, we are recruiting you as this, as part of the recruiting pitch, as part of trying to cultivate, you know, an image and a plan of what they what they believe that prospect can be and getting him to buy into that or, you know, knowing that that's what he already wants to do and that, and that helps. Um, you know, Eric Shaw comes to mind out of Alabama with, you know, South Carolina with Bobby Bentley pretty early on recruited him as a tight end, which is what he was, you know, eventually <laughs> after his senior year, his huge senior year, he said, hey, I could be a defensive player. And he was fine with that. And heck, probably Will Muschamp would probably love that too now that now that he's signed with South Carolina. But um, they, they recruited him very early on as a tight end. And they were one of the first schools in on that. I think South Carolina and LSU were a couple recruiting him at that position early, and he was really intrigued by that. I think that really helped open the door for South Carolina. So you see a few different strategies there. Sometimes you see the strategy shift. Um, but I, I think Sanders is one where we've seen some schools. I know West reported that Auburn was recruiting him as a linebacker. Oklahoma sort of said, hey, do, let's do whatever. South Carolina said, hey, you're an offensive player. We think you're a receiver. And so you will see different strategies um, sort of sort of come to the surface from these schools in the recruiting process. All right, last guy I want to touch on today, uh, Wes. What's the latest with Kwan Powell? Yeah, I think with, with Kwan, he's a kid out of Vernon, Florida, running back target for South Carolina, and probably fits in that same category we're talking about, like with Raheem Sanders, where I think you've seen South Carolina sort of, uh, you know, up their recruitment of him, I guess. And, you know, I think you look at, at these two positions, obviously, you know, in the case of Raheem Sanders, Joe Cox sort of taking over the receiver position and kind of putting his uh, his stamp on, you know, who they're going to recruit there and, and what they're looking for there. And then, obviously, Des Kitchings joining the staff. I guess that was about a month ago now. And, you know, he it's kind of been a mix. I think with, with Kitchings, he's sort of, for the most part, recruited kind of the same guys, but he's, he's put his stamp on that position and maybe a guy gets moved up the board, maybe a guy gets moved down. And, uh, you know, in the case of K1 Powell, 
South Carolina actually had offered him, much like Raheem Sanders, they had offered him earlier this year. I think it was like early February. But, um, you know, this is a case of, of really Des Kitchings coming in the last few weeks has sort of reprioritized K1 Powell. And, and I, I think it's paying off. And, and again, it, these, these two recruitments actually sort of mirror each other in that um, it, it's, a, it's a case here where K1 Powell has never visited South Carolina before. Uh, you know, he actually got on a FaceTime. Uh, here recently with, with Muschamp and the entire staff when they were really reiterating to him how uh, how much of a priority that, you know, he is for them now and, and you know, wanting to get him on campus. In, in the case of k talking to him, I, I don't think he's anywhere close to making a decision. I think he's – some guys have sort of gone back and forth about, you know, how do, how do I handle this? He has been firmly, I think, in the camp of just going to wait and see, wait till he can take a visit. And, you know, I, I think whenever we're, we're covering recruiting, um, and Chris, you'll probably agree with this, I think you're always looking for the guys where there's an intersection between South Carolina really likes them and really wants them, and the kid seems really, really interested in South Carolina. So um, if you sort of want to take a, a step back, that, that's what you're always looking for because that means there's a pretty good chance of that guy ending up, you know, sometimes – Maybe the kid, you know, South Carolina likes the guy a lot, but he's not quite as high on South Carolina. Other times their kid may really like South Carolina, but he's down on their board. But I, I think with Kwan Powell, you've sort of identified someone who, who meets both of those criteria, even without him visiting. He, he just sounds very excited about checking out the program. Um, when, when I asked him the schools he wanted to visit, South Carolina was the first school out of his mouth. Um, you know, I think, again, just like with Sanders, FSU is, is pretty, you know, is involved here. I don't know how high he is on FSU's board, um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see sort of how that goes. But I think as long as he visits like he's planning to and, and gets, you know, gets up here, he's a guy that very easily could end up being in, in South Carolina's class this year. Uh, Wes, this is a random thought I just had because you mentioned when you asked him what schools he wanted to visit, he said the first place that came out of his mouth. Uh, you said the first place that came out of his mouth was South Carolina. When, when you talk to recruits, do you just say, you know, hey, I'm I'm with Gamecock Central? Do you say, hey, I'm with Rivals, or do you just say, hey, I, you know, I do recruiting stuff? How, how do they? Uh, how do you introduce yourself to them? Like, does he have the expectation that you're doing South Carolina stuff, and so he's more inclined to say pro South Carolina things to you? Yeah, I think there is an aspect to that. Um, you know, I I don't know about Chris, but I I used to make a point. I would just say rivals like I would just say the national site um, now honestly I, I tend to more mention you know that I'm with the South Carolina rival site mainly because you know it used to be if I got a kid I'm, I'm going to try to ask him about as many schools as possible and get his thoughts on all the schools now you know what man these kids get hit up for so many different interviews and phone calls and texts and all this stuff I'm trying to just get the quotes I need and, and let the kid get off the phone, honestly, as quick as possible. So I sort of set the expectation early on. Hey, um, I, I cover South Carolina, so there's going to be some South Carolina questions here and and then sort of knock those out. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, especially when, when the kid knows we've been talking about mm-hmm. South Carolina, there, you know, there's a better chance of, of him mentioning them first as far as visits. But, but generally for what I find, you know, I, I'll tell a kid, hey, all right, um, let, let's go a little more big picture here and just talk about your recruiting process um, from a more general standpoint mm-hmm. and ask them, you know, what, what are the visits you want to take? What's going to be important to you, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, there, there is a, probably a little bit of that. And let's be honest, most of the time kids are going to say positive things about the school you're, you're asking them about. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, um, I have no yeah. interest in visiting Georgia. Uh, it stinks there. I don't like Kirby Smart. And yeah, yeah you, you don't. You don't really get that. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, that, that that is an aspect of it. But just sort of the, the way he said it as well and just the excitement of, mm-hmm. about visiting. And he even said um, – the reason I bring that up is he even said he's like, he's like man, I, I told Coach Muschamp that I can't wait to, to get up there for a visit. Mm-hmm. So, to me, that stood out more than just your typical, oh, yeah, I'm going to visit Florida State, South Carolina, USF, which is what you typically you know get when you ask that question. Chris, is that your approach as well? Yeah, for the most part. Um, and, and honestly, sometimes if, if you're shooting out a text or calling a kid, I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll, 
I'll start with that. I'm, you know, I work on the rivals network just because I think it's sometimes a little bit more recognizable to the kid. You know, again, like Wes said, they're getting hit up. You got to think about the volume of calls and texts these guys are getting, especially right now. You know, you think about if they're getting recruited by 20 schools, like some of the top prospects getting recruited by 20 or 30 schools. Not only are they getting hit up by multiple coaches a lot of times from those schools daily, they're also getting hit up by people from, you know, say even if you had one person per, you know, recruiting market, but there's often multiple. (laughs) So it it can really add up. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, the point is maybe they're not as familiar, but people are generally familiar with rivals, you know, or, or another, you know, news outlet or whatever it may be. And so, but generally, if you're asking them about a specific school like South Carolina, you'll say, hey, you know, the school I cover, or for some people on our network, one of the schools I cover is this school. So, hey, I'm going to ask you some questions mm-hmm. about this. No. Um, I do think you try as best you can, whether it's through building relationships or just, you know, what, what you say to them, you try to get them to, to level with you and be honest and understand that we're not after <clears throat> having them, you know, of course they're going to say positive things about South Carolina for the most part, but that's our intent is to try to figure out where things stand and to give, get them to give us some honest, you know, level thoughts on where things stand. That, that's sort of the goal when we talk to them. Um, that's interesting. That's, and I'm glad you said that, Wes, because I, I never thought about that before, but I appreciate y'all's, uh, y'all's candor and insight on that. And as we get a little bit more into the summer, I think we're going to, if it's okay with y'all, peel back the curtain a little bit more because I, I know I'm not the only one that listens to this podcast. And, uh, yeah, I do listen to this podcast because oh, I'm, I'm listening to y'all talk, but anyway, I'm not the only one that listens to y'all, uh, that's curious about the process. So hopefully we can delve a little bit more into that as we progress through the summer and sort of the end of quarantine and, you know, still are kind of trying to keep things fresh and uh, and interesting. But uh, today, I don't even know if we'll have a chance. We, you and I, uh, I guess I'll tease it now. Uh, you and I, Wes, were talking yesterday and Chris this morning about going back and maybe thinking about some recruits that maybe nobody knew about. And you were like, wait, this kid's going to be really good. Or uh, maybe someone that you were high on that, you know, didn't pan out for whatever reason and ended up, you know, transferring or not sticking with it or, you know, whatever the case may be. So we're going to have some Tales from the Trail, maybe is what we'll call it, something like that. That, we'll, like I said, we'll get into as the summer progresses. But uh, too much actual, you know, real like current news and content uh, to do today. So we're we're planning on, or we're tentatively planning on doing that today. I think we're going to table that until at least next week because now we're going to transition out of recruiting talk. And uh, before we get, I guess, to the roster as presently constituted, one more piece that I guess is a Carolina signee. So in between recruiting and the actual team, and that is a Quandre White who is expected to enroll this fall, um, but it's you know just a matter of making sure that he gets into school, grades are in order, I guess, things like that. And Will Muschamp did give an update on Zaquandre White, uh, what South Carolina is expecting of him uh, come this fall. Uh, Wes or Chris, I don't know which one of you has been covering or following this more closely, uh, but whichever one of you, uh, what's the latest with Zaquandre White? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in, Chris. Um, you know, I, I think with White, as far as the timetable, um, you know, this is fairly new. I, I think that we were all sort of wondering, and you, ne- you really, honestly, you never know. Uh, you know, it's all about uh, what classes is a guy taking? Does he does he pass all of his classes, obviously? Then you have to go through the enrollment process at South Carolina. So you never can tell. Some guys that are JUCO obviously come in. They're ready to go mid-year. They're on campus in January. They go through spring practice. Other guys, they can't go through spring, but they get in for like May Mester and they go through the entire summer. Uh, was the Quandre White, you know, Will Muschamp confirming this uh, with an interview with Sports Talk SC yesterday. He said, uh, and I'll just quote it, the Quandre is working through a couple classes in June and probably won't be with us until August. He's got to finish up a few classes, and I would probably say the date he'd be done with that is the middle of July. So uh, essentially, you know, not uh, – but let's be honest, that's, that's not necessarily the ideal scenario for, for a new guy coming in because you really want for them to be able to get in and go through, especially in a normal year, your, your summer workout program, and, and maybe even especially with everything right now, go ahead and, and get in shape, but especially when I think you consider that White is someone that we've sort of pegged as being a, a guy who can, I think, help this team right off the bat. Uh, talking to people around the program, you know, I, I think they feel really – really good about the running back room 
considering that this is a room that lost four seniors, if you count A.J. Turner, most of the time if you lose four seniors from a position group, you're you're kind of screwed. And in this case, they feel really good about the, the running backs. But I, I think part of that, especially from a depth standpoint, is uh, – you know, the fact that they got this kid, White, coming in who who has a little bit of experience at, at the Power 5 level, has done some good things at JUCO as, a, as an older guy compared to the other guys. And, uh, you know, I, I think Des Kitchings is, is pretty high on the kids. So that, to me, is, is really sort of one of the burning questions that I guess we'll be tracking leading into, um, you know, the, the fall and, and getting them in. It'll be much like, you know, Tavian Feaster, obviously a different situation, but Feaster – you know, sort of arrived right right when camp was starting and you're playing catch-up. So, uh, Chris, uh, I'm curious your opinion on this as well because I think we all have White as being a guy physically who can step in and, and play. But I, I think this, you know, if he gets in in August, it's going to be really important that he's found a way back at home to, to stay in shape and, and to stay – uh, you know, it, it's really it's one thing to be in shape to to go for a run around the neighborhood, and it's a completely other thing to be in Columbia in August football shape. So, um, I, I this to me maybe puts White more in the category of somebody that helps potentially later in the season, just being realistic, than being a guy that just steps right in and is playing day one. You know, against Coastal Carolina for for South Carolina. Yeah, that <clears throat> conditioning is going to be a question for him and, and really for everybody. Now, some of the players, it looks like we're on track for them to get back earlier. If I had to, you know, make a projection on that, I think the players are going to be allowed back sometime in June to do some things on their own, and then full team will have, you know, multiple weeks to get ready. It won't be completely ideal, but it'll be a lot better than them showing up just, you know, after lifting milk jugs or whatever they do at home for, you know, a couple months. And so – you know, they will have some time. And so that's a question for anybody. You know, uh, we, we've seen Wes uh, several times, you know, there have been some junior college guys who, and White was never really projected to enroll in January, but we've seen some at South Carolina in the past who were projected to enroll in January. They weren't able to. They got there later, say July or August. And that honestly set them back in terms of playing time for, for many reasons. And so at a at a really unique time like this, I think that's amplified a little bit. So, That'll be a key question with White. If they can get him in and he can give them something early in the season and work his way more and more into more playing time, or if he can just surprise and be, and be completely ready to go immediately, I think that's a big boost. I think uh, it's not quite the same because, you know, when Tavian Feaster got here last year, you remember he got in late. He had to finish up at Clemson. He was cleared sort of late. He had to work himself into that sort of practice shape, even though he'd been working out. You know, there were still some some differences there. And uh, he was able to give them a significant boost, even from even from game one. I mean, he scored a touchdown in game one against North Carolina. So um, I think that was a significant boost to them for their running game, where they had some nice performances last year. And, you know, now they're changing over most of the running back room and losing a bunch of seniors. So to have a talented guy, Marshawn Lloyd, and being able to pair him with Zaquandre White plus Harris plus Finn, which we've already been on the roster, I think would be significant for them. There's one other wrinkle to this, uh, but real quick, if we can just sum this up, is it fair to say, Wes, that uh, Zaquandre White, it, he is they're expecting him to be with the team, but, I mean, obviously you said, you know, like middle of July or, or beginning of August is when he's going to be finishing up and, and getting on campus with the team. But does, does that sound to you like, yeah, it's later than expected, but we still think this is going to happen? Or does that, to you, sound like there's still a chance that he will not meet the qualifications to be on the team this fall? Yeah, you know, Muschamp um, said he, he fully expects him to make it. Obviously, okay. there is a, you know, there, there's a real-world aspect here in that nothing, nothing is 100%, man. I, I mean, he's got to actually uh, complete the classes. Um, that he's going to be taking this summer. So, you know, no, nothing is ever 100% with this stuff. We've seen this with JUCOs before. But but for the most part, you know, under under Will Muschamp, I would say there's been a, a strong shift where you saw um, previously, you know, as good as, as things were at times under Steve Spurrier, you, you almost for a while there just accepted there was going to be 
a few guys that, that didn't qualify um, and, and had to had to go a different direction or had to go to prep school or JUCO first. I, I think under Muschamp, these guys have gotten qualified and, and gotten in. So, but with, with this, it's just going to be about him finishing finishing off the work, and, and obviously, it's all going to be virtual. So, it's just on him to to get it done and, and then get in. But but yeah, you know, I, I think you're talking about a kid who obviously is sort of driven because he's he, he's only got so much eligibility left. And, um, you know, he, he wants to come in and put himself in a position to, to come in and play. And, and again, they're, I mean, they're excited about him. I, I think, uh, obviously, there's a lot of excitement about Marshawn Lloyd. But, uh, hey, White, White's going to come in. And I had somebody, um, this has been a few months ago, even tell me, you know, hey, White, White could potentially come in and, and push Lloyd. Now, um, with, with Lloyd's drive and everything we've been told about him since he got to campus in the spring, I'm still – I mean – I think Chris and I both thought he was going to take the first carry, but I think you can double, triple down on that at this point. Marshawn Lloyd's going to be the guy this year, but having a, you know, you can never do it with just one. So I think White coming in, can he push a Kevin Harris? Um, you know, even Deshaun Fenwick, there, there's been some positive things there. Rashad Amos, they're, they're high on him, the freshman. So um, there, there's going to be a lot of competition at that position. Um you know, I think Lloyd's the guy, but but who's number two, I think, is a real question. All right, so here's the wrinkle. If he's getting to campus in early August, Chris, is he actually going to be getting there late relative to the rest of the team? <laughs> um, well, somewhat. From a conditioning standpoint, yeah. Um, you know, because the, the rest of the team <sighs> – we still don't fully know what it's going to look like, but what we think now is this. Sometime in June, whether it's the beginning or the middle of June, it seems like there's momentum to allow players back on campus to go into the facility, to get A, get back on campus, B, go into the facility and start doing voluntary workouts. That's a game changer because now you're putting down the milk jugs I was talking about, and you're picking up, you know, everything in that gigantic weight right mm-hmm. and, yeah how much milk just, is in these jugs by the way because that's i don't think that's a, a real workout well i mean if you if you lift a gallon milk jug enough it'll it'll do something for you i mean okay. it's better than nothing um you got to do like a hundred reps though it's yeah. like high rep 100 reps yeah it's, it's it's more toning i guess you would say <laughs> um but but you know it, it's no, some and some guys have had access whether they're going to a high school or they have something at home. I mean, you know, but it, it look, it's not ideal what they've been doing by any means. And so now they're going to be able to get together. The 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 thought process and what I've heard from some coaches around college football is they'll be training in like pods. So whether it's the people that you live with, or whether it's by you know position group or however they break it down, you know, it's not going to be a hundred and five guys all standing beside each other working out at the same time. You know, when when they're doing voluntary stuff or when they're together as a full team uh, during the season, they'll probably be training in pods um, to, to, to help with everything. And that's been sort of the recommendations at the high school and the college level as well as they phase in things. And so they'll be able – let's say they get back June 15th or June 1st or whatever, they'll have some time to do that. And then at some point, you know, the, the team stuff's going to kick in. Okay, now you can go back to team meetings, actual real team meetings. Okay, now you can have – an OTA style practice, even if it's in some type of phase. Okay, now you can put on the pads and have a couple weeks of practice. So some of it it might be changed, and it might be, you know, it's going to be different somehow. But at some point, they got to let these guys put the pads back on and go practice if they're going to get ready for an actual game. Um, now they may only have a couple weeks of it, as opposed to say like a full month of preseason camp. It may look a little different, um, but they're going to have some of that. So. I say all that, say that, yeah, it, he's still going to be a little bit behind. Anybody who literally gets to campus right at the beginning of August, maybe he can participate in camp or some of those OTA-type things that they've talked about having, but he won't have the access to that full weight room for voluntary stuff either. So there's always somewhat of a setback, um, you know, when you can't do that stuff because it's such a big piece of it. Right. Uh, Colin Taylor has the write-up on GamecockCentral.com, so y'all can go check it out there if you're a subscriber. And by the way, if you're not a subscriber, you can be for free uh, all the way until August. And uh, if you haven't if you haven't figured it out by now, there's still plenty of stuff going on despite the fact that there's quarantine, a lot of recruiting news. And as the uh, football team starts to 
head in the direction of getting back to campus and starting practice and starting to sort things out on the depth chart. Uh, Gamecock Central is going to be GamecockCentral.com as well as the Gamecock Central Podcast Network are going to be your hubs. So go check it out. Go read Colin's piece. Uh, again, he's got the sort of the, the official N-word written, Will Muschamp discuss his plan if athletes return to campus kind of deal. Uh, but, Wes, right now, uh, as Chris mentioned, it's going to be a lot of you know working out in pods. There's like a 10 right. to 12 people in the building kind of restriction. Is this a... I, I guess I should say, is this a restriction implemented by the university? Is this a recommendation? How strictly must this and will this be followed? Or are these like general guidelines, but ultimately everyone's going to get back on campus and then things are going to start to look a little more normal in terms of the day-to-day football routine? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know exactly at what level that, that comes down from, but I, I do think it will be strictly, I, I think it will be strictly adhered to as far as the guidelines go. Um you know, I actually, so the vote, I get, we're recording this on Wednesday. I guess the vote um, from the SEC is going to be on Thursday. Um, I was told um, that there actually are several, there were several options here, which um, the ones most publicized have obviously been June 1, June 15th. Um, but June 1, June 15th, June 30th, July 15th, and August 1st are actually the uh, complete dates that have sort of been discussed and thrown out as potential return dates i tend to think um, if you're looking at june 1 or, or maybe june 15th if if the sec just decides hey we're ready but let's let's sort of slow this down and, and make sure there's time to get all the protocols in place and you know from what Muschamp said in one of the interviews they basically have a plan in place for for every potential date and those plans are already sort of uh you know been put together they'll obviously adjust if they need be if there's sec or ncaa guidelines that are that are put in but you know from from everything i've heard south carolina's um, medical staff is sort of in charge of of all these protocols and stuff it's not something where you're even doing that at a football coach level it's more hey let the medical um basically professionals make these type of decisions just like um it's the SEC presidents that are voting, but it is uh, with the SEC medical task force that, that's actually sort of um, giving their opinion to the various presidents on, on how to go about doing this. So, you know, I, I think um, I think they're going to go about it in a smart way, man. And, and honestly, I've seen some sort of fringe stuff in comments, you know, people freaking out about, well, you know, players coming back and how can you have football and not this, et cetera, et cetera. But, guys, I – I think being on campus right now, if you're really, if you're really worried about the virus, that's probably the safest place in the whole state <laughs> right now. No one's there. there. There's nobody there, and everything is going to be. I mean, talk about a sanitary environment compared to just being out in the world. You know, I, I mean, every, here everything is handled. So. The, you know, the, the weight facility is going to be wiped down after every single workout. You're coming in in pods. I'm, I haven't seen the guidelines. I don't even know if the guidelines have been, you know, made official. Mm-hmm. But I guarantee there's going to be checks and balances along the way that you're going to be doing temperature checks when guys come in, that there's going to be periodical testing. I'm sure all the guys will be tested before they even get back on campus or as they get back on campus. So, you're telling me that that's not more safe than all the guys being spread out in whatever uh, community that they're in already without all these checks and, you know, and, and I guess uh, cleanliness factors in, in place. I there, There's nowhere safer right now for an SEC football player than right there on their SEC campus. Not to mention uh, that football facility, it, it kind of reminds me of like Disney World or Singapore where I can't confirm this, I've never seen it, but it seems like the kind of place that, you know, if you accidentally drop like a crumb from a cracker, that all of a sudden like someone's going to leap out from behind a wall and like vacuum it up immediately so that the whole thing continues to just look ridiculously pristine. Uh, well, we did There's our media a tour. Robot. I, There's huh? a robot. That just, yeah, yeah. A robot, robot that just comes out from uh, the wall. The Roomba or just, something. Uh, yeah, it just cleans up behind you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So I, I think that's, have a, you, that's a good point. Speaking of that, that made me think of something funny, Pearson. So have, have you guys seen, I, I think it's CDC, it may be DHEC, one of those two, they, they, there are guidelines for pools as things have begun to reopen. Have you guys seen or heard of this? No. What the guidelines no. are? <laughs> so basically, all right, if you have a pool, 
you're, and some people are opting not to open the pool because you can only do a certain capacity and it's just really tough to, hey, guys, get out. But anyway, the guidelines for opening your pool are, according to some people who run facilities that have told me, hey, at every single time a person gets up from, like, every time a ladder is used, if there's a table and chairs, every time somebody gets up from a table or chairs, or uses, you know, a diving board, whatever it may be, Every time that happens, somebody must clean and sanitize it before the next use. Mm. Every single time, or once a day. Those are literally the guidelines. <laughs> or, or, once or, a day. or once a day. Or once a day. Yes. So the guidelines are this: you must clean everything every time it's used, or just once a day. <laughs> yeah, or, or just don't. Your, your pick. <laughs> so, That's amazing. That's what I've had two different people tell me that that's what the guidelines say, and so it's, uh, that's pretty funny. So you better be careful, would, unless uh, you don't want to. I would think that they'll wipe down stuff, you know, more often in the facility because, look, and, and I'm gonna be quite honest. Not only are administrators and coaches g- gonna be thinking about the players' health at a time like this, but it, it's not gonna be. It, it'll be a little bit more hyperactive with it. But they, we talked about this before. They they face these things during the season. When you have a hundred and something guys together, if somebody gets sick, just whether it's the flu or like just some kind of stomach bug, whatever happens, mm-hmm. you got to be careful, you know, uh, because you don't want that going through your team during the season. That can sideline guys too. Didn't you that know, happen last year? Different. It did. Or was it that did two happen? Years ago. Yeah. No, it happened. I think it was last year. And Will Muschamp said, "Look, we had to get the facility." you know, clean down, you know, a couple times this week. And so these teams have some experience. They don't have experience with this or like protocols in place for this, but I think they, they can have a general idea of, you know, how they're going to do it. And I would think they'll go with the more than probably go with the more than once a day cleaning, if I have to guess and put Wes's <laughs> robot into place. Yeah. It seems like that'll be, that'll be uh, recommended hey, or a good idea or something. You know, you know what else we've learned today is that, not only does Chris have South Carolina and SEC sources, but he has uh, pool sources as well. Pool source, yeah. Pool source is a new one. Incredibly so, uh, well connected. I'm here. Chris Clark. <laughs> Follow him for all of your Gamecock football and pool updates at GC Chris Clark. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let, let's let's. Uh, I guess we'll just do this before we get out of here today. Um, shift uh, even closer to the team, to the actual team, uh, to the team that might be, that will probably be on the field and what exactly it will look like. Uh, Wes, you mentioned a couple of interviews that Will Muschamp have done in the last week or so, just talking about some more specifics about his team, which, again, another great sign. We're not talking about will there be a football season, won't there be a football season. We're talking about when will there be a football season, what will it look like. And for Will Muschamp, he's finally starting to talk about what his team will look like because, again, we're all optimistic and encouraged and planning on having football as usual. Um, now, you listen to the interview. I haven't listened to it yet because I'm not a professional, and it's also a little bit personal. Uh, but what did Will Muschamp have to say just about the actual composition of his team in terms of what he expects to see this fall? Yeah, I thought there were some interesting things uh, that you could sort of glean. Most of it was the same stuff we already know. Um, you know, first of all, some injury updates, uh, positive things on Dylan Wanham, Nick Muse, Colin Hill, and Jaheim Bell. You know, he joked that uh, the Jaheim Bell has been sending him videos pretty much every day and that he uh, he was sort of worried that, you know, lightheartedly worried that Bell was doing too much, that he felt, you know, Bell, one of the guys that had ACL surgery um, last year. So, so all those guys are, are in really good shape as far as their return to the team and, and help. And, uh, you know, Bell, one of the guys, obviously a freshman, who will be enrolling at, at some point this summer and, Again, Muschamp sort of mentioned that, yeah, Bell came in as a tight end, but he's a guy that they'll probably move around. Will um, sort of hinted that maybe he could play some wide receiver, which is something we, that we've talked about. But I thought the most interesting thing about the actual team was the talk about the scheme. You know, I, I think, you know, you look and when whenever they've been asked about the offensive scheme, they've really, for the most part, he and Bobo have said, we'll we'll see what the guys can do and, and sort of go from there. And I think that's still the case. They they probably won't know until they really get through training camp exactly what this team does well and they'll they'll focus the, the playbook and at least the game day play calling down into the things that they do well. But, you know, he, he mentioned the, the scheme and the running game in particular. 
He said that a lot of the passing game scheme will be very similar just because a lot of what Brian McClendon was doing was sort of based off some stuff he had learned from, from Mike Bobo originally when they coached together before, but that the, the sort of rushing attack schematically is going to be much different. And he even said, you know, fans are going to see a lot of different things from the running game. Uh, more under center, obviously we knew that, but I, I think that's probably one of the more intriguing things. And, and you know, you look – Something that, that I think has come up a lot is that Muschamp sort of doubled down on the idea that they as a staff, and I, I think some of this, uh, frankly, is sort of pointing a finger back at Brian McClendon as a staff, uh, didn't do enough to help Ryan Holinsky, particularly mm-hmm. late in the year. And uh, Muschamp mentioned, I, I don't know the exact uh, timetable for the stat, but he said, you know, I think it was like the last four games, South Carolina threw the ball 38 more times than um, than anybody else in the SEC or, or something. Wow. Basically saying, um, got away from the running game, didn't put your freshman quarterback in a position to succeed, and uh, really that's something that they have to, have to fix. So I think you are going to see a little bit more dedication to the running game. That fits with what we've seen from Mike Bobo historically, but also just based off what we saw from South Carolina last year, that seems to be the way this thing's headed. Well, we talked a little bit about how things might look different in terms of the schematic approach to the running game, especially adding in a fullback, which, I mean, Chris, Wes, whichever one of you can come up with it first. Like, wh- wh- when was the last time and who was the last fullback that South Carolina had on its roster? Well, I mean, true fullback. Pat DeMarco, probably the last true fullback. Yeah. Was, they, was they Quad sort of... Chris before or after? And he wasn't even really a true fullback, was he? No, he he was like a converted linebacker who played at some. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they've sort of used guys in spots, like Spencer Easton Riddle played at some, you know. Um, Kevin Harris Kevin lined Harris, up as a fullback as a, last year, but yeah, yeah he's used, a fullback. Right, right. Chris, and remember back who, in the earlier uh, days, Lennard Stafford. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was one. <laughs> that, that might be who was the Who was the fullback? No, because um, – I'm trying to think of the timetable for all this. DeMarco was after Stafford. Um, yeah. But there was somebody after DeMarco that was uh, Spurrier era, sort of, um, you know, even, even when they went more to the spread and zone read and stuff like that, there were times when they would have, it would be shotgun and like an offset fullback, um, a guy that would move around and, and really never uh, – Never did much in in the running game or passing game himself. Never touched the football. And I'm trying to think. It was a walk on kid that that played a that actually played a pretty good bit um, in those in those sort of later Spurrier years. And I can't place him to save my life. Anybody know his name? We're gonna have to think on that one a little bit. I, I feel uh, like do you I'm know what number he was? Myself. Because uh, do I know what? I, I kind of have was. like, yeah. If you give me a number, maybe I can come up with a name on the back of the jersey. Like, just visualize it. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but hold, but hold on. But by the end of this show, which is actually pretty soon, I'm going to have an answer for you because I remember <laughs> I, I've been watching old games on YouTube a lot lately, uh-huh. and I actually remember a game. I, y'all remember when South Carolina just smashed Arkansas mm-hmm. at Arkansas? Is that like fifty-two um, to seven or fifty-two to six or something? Just yeah, just annihilated them. I remember uh, watching that game. They're like, man, they actually used a fullback a lot more than I remembered. Um, and I think with Spurrier, it sort of just depended game to game. You know, sometimes wh- whatever he thought was was best for for that particular opponent, that particular week, that scheme was what you were going to see from the offense. And uh, the other funny thing about that game is that Arkansas actually went straight down the field and scored on the very yeah. first drive of the game in like three minutes, and you were like, man, the Carolina's defense looks awful today. And then the offense just obliterated Arkansas. The defense uh, got to stop every single drive from that point forward, and Brendan Nosevich got to score a late touchdown. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, the uh, by the end of the game, Brendan Nosevich is in there running around for – didn't he score a touchdown in that game, Nasi? I think he did. Uh does he does he listen to me, Pearson? <laughs> um, 
Uh, I, Dude, I, I, honestly, I pulled a West on that one because I was trying to look. I heard most of what you said, and then I, zoomed, I zoned out for just a second. But you did that to me the other day, too, so it was a little payback. Yeah. Uh, we All just right, wanted well, to make sure we got two Brendan well, Nosovich shout-outs in the, that, in the podcast. That is, that's what I – I'm giving you hell because that was exactly what I just said. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I deserve it, man. I really oh, do, cool. and I and I apologize personally to you. No, so you know no, what? I think we, I came this... up with the name. Uh, oh, after the fullback? embarrassing myself. Yeah, is was it Connor McLaurin? Yes, yes, number forty-one, 41 right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was him. Yeah, yeah. him. Forty-one. So yeah, was, if you just said forty-one, I would have come up with that. Yep. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right, good he stuff. Played a, he played a lot, like a pretty good bit. So that was him. That was the last fullback that South Carolina had, basically, and he was a walk-on. I, I think. I mean, th- that game was in 2013. Um, so that you know, you're talking the end of the Spurrier. Let's see when when did Connor McLaurin? And I, I think he was truly listed as a fullback, which you know, as we talked about, some of the, you know, Kevin Harris has lined up as a fullback, mm-hmm. but you know, he, he's a running back and. Let's see. Connor McLaurin was a redshirt senior. Wow, he's from Garner High School in Raleigh, which is the same school as Chris Culver. Um, He was a senior in 2014. Okay, so it's been been six years since Carolina's had a fullback. That seems about right. I don't know how many other places around the country have a fullback. But anyway, all that to say, since we're talking about like revamping the running game, we've talked about how that's going to look different with South Carolina actually having a fullback and a guy in Adam Prentice that I you know I remember I guess we only they only had what four or five we only had four or five spring practices to talk about but it seemed like the early uh, impression was like yeah Adam Prentice is uh, is a grown man and he's going to hit you and also it helps that he's like 27 um and this is his you know 10th year of college football or whatever but uh that that's going to obviously be the kind of the centerpiece of what looks different for Carolina's rushing attack but did you get any greater sense uh, did Will Muschamp give any indications in terms of like, is it still going to be heavy zone, just more out of, you know, eye formations and, and using a fullback as a blocker? Is it going to be more, um, I, I don't know what the other options are, straight runs, things like that? Or, or was he just kind of saying that it's going to look different in terms of the rushing attack? Yeah, I would say sort of the uh, the latter there, man. He he just said it was going to look very different. But he, he even, he sort of was talking to the fans. He said, he said our, our fans were going to see that this, this rushing scheme is going to look quite different. So, uh, still, I guess we're a little bit in the dark on, on what that may mean, but I, I think that that's um, that's at least an intriguing sign. I was going to say it's a good sign, but w- when something's not working, you got to put, you know, you got to change it up and, and see see what you can do to sort of find a way to to, to make it work. And I, I think we saw, I mean, guys, I've never seen um, a run game look so good for a stretch, and uh, you know, and then just disappear and uh you know late la- middle of last year the running game was really really good mm-hmm. and then the latter what fourth of the season i would say the running game just was atrocious so i, I think that's something that you gotta you gotta find a way to fix and and i think you know they're probably gonna have to be a bit hard-headed in that a little bit and just sometimes you have to run the football even if it's not working just to sort of give your your defense a rest and I, I personally think this is a team that's going to have to sort of shorten games, win with defense, and um, I think that means a lot of running game, and I think that means a, a lot of Marshawn Lloyd. I, I think he has a chance to – I would be surprised if Marshawn Lloyd is not on the freshman All-SEC team wow. um, this year just because – well, I mean, if you look at the freshman team, a lot of times um, that's just a combination of here's a talented guy mixed with – the opportunity to to get on the field a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think with Lloyd, you have that combination. Super talented guy. He's a professional. uh, Just attacks everything. Muschamp told the story on the Sports Talk interview. He said that that Lloyd, he he got the grades from from this last semester, and he called Lloyd to congratulate him on uh, making a 3.6 this semester. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said Lloyd got mad at him um, and was like, Coach, the – the professor had my grade wrong. I actually got a 4-0 um, and was just upset that Muschamp would think that he didn't have a perfect score. Wow. <laughs> so that's just the type uh, – that's just the type sort of perfectionist, I guess, is probably the right word that this kid is. When, I mean, when you combine 
that mindset, with that talent, with the opportunity, normally good things happen. That's great. Well, yeah, and it's just uh, you have to hope that that encourages the coaching staff to stick with it a little bit more, and maybe Mike Bobo will be more inclined to do that than uh, Brian McClendon was. Uh, not that I think you know Brian McClendon has anything against running the football, but you don't know. Maybe as a, as a former wide receiver, he's more inclined to to throw the football because I mean you're exactly right. Like there's no reason the running game should not have been more productive towards the end of last year. I know Rico was a little bit banged up. There were some injuries on the offensive line, but there's just no way that the running game should have been that bad compared to how how just frankly how good it was. I was going to say how decent, but it was just a really really good rushing attack. And Tavian Feaster and Rico Dowdle for three fourths of the football season were among the most productive running backs in the SEC on a yards per carry basis and, you know, yards after contact and things like that. It was just tremendous. So hopefully uh, Zaquandre White can get on campus and he and Marshawn Lloyd and Kevin Harris and Deshaun Fenwick and Rashad Amos can all uh, convince the coaching staff to, to run the football a little more because I think you're exactly right in terms of needing to shorten the game uh, and things like that. Uh, all right, last thing, and this is uh, a little bit uh, outside of football, but just wanted to get y'all's quick thoughts on this and if you have any behind-the-scenes knowledge. Uh, and we'll start with you, Chris. Uh, President Caslin. Uh, I still call him Coach Ray Tanner, but obviously the athletic director, uh, President Caslin's cabinet, and then the top three paid head coaches of the University of South Carolina, Frank Martin, Don Staley, and of course Will Muschamp, are all taking 10% pay cuts to basically just help the university out because of the financial hit that they've taken with the COVID-19 shutdown. Uh, do you all know, uh, or do you know, Chris, if this was something, did President Caslin go to Ray Tanner and the coaches and say, hey, we want to do this? Did the coaches go to President Caslin and Ray Tanner and say, hey, you know, if this will help, we want to do this? Uh, do you know how that conversation happened? Pearson, you cut out a, just a little bit on me. Do you mind re-saying that? I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, just how, how did that conversation go? Did President Caslin go to those coaches and Coach Tanner, or was it the other way around in terms of discussing that 10% pay cut? You know, I've asked a little bit on that, and I haven't been able to really glean the details of, of how that was. You know, th there have been a lot of conversations behind the scenes in college athletics, and South Carolina isn't alone on this, of, you know, hey, how are we going to save money, right? I mean, that's – we've seen some schools have to eliminate sports. I mean, Furman just had to cut baseball, which is devastating. But it's happened with multiple sports at multiple places. And this is one reason why, again, we won't get into this, but we discussed this, this is why football has to happen, you know, uh, with as many fans as possible and as many games as possible to keep that revenue stream going because football drives everything. Um, but this this has already affected people academically and in the athletic department. And so um, I, I heard from people at the university, you know, this spring and into the come into the more recent weeks of, you know, hey, lots of schools have started to do this. They've started announcing this. And it's a lot of people thought it would just naturally happen. So I do not know who approached who first. I could not tell you. Um, and I don't want to say, hey, my guess is this, because I really don't know. Um, I do know that Bob Caslin, when he got to South Carolina, one of the things that I heard, this is way before all this pandemic hit. We had no idea that there, you know, coronavirus even existed. Uh, in its current form, but w we heard that on the academic side that he was probably going to make some cuts um, to to help with, you know, keeping tuition where it was, to help just the books, you know, uh, in, in terms of just university spending as a whole, that he probably cut some things. Well, now, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's been accelerated. They got to cut some things because they're having to issue refunds on the academic side for a lot of different stuff, and this has bled over into athletics. So, uh, that's a long-winded way of me saying I really don't know, you know, who, you know, I didn't, I figured it would happen. I didn't know what the amount would be or how they came to the amount. Um, I think in just looking over the books, you know, my, my guess is it's something that they, they talk to the coaches about and say, hey, will you be willing to do this? But mm -hmm. I, I don't want to speak out of turn there. I really don't know. Yeah. Uh, 1.2 million is what the university is estimating this will save them, which is a, that's a good chunk. Um, and, and Wes, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if, if the coaches came forward and did this, you know, I mean, especially those three, obviously they, they make a lot of money. We saw Will Muschamp willingly take a pay cut, uh, I guess before the start of last season, it was it, basically, essentially he took a pay cut that then went to pay Thomas Brown's contract. If my understanding and uh, remembering of that, well, that was is this, correct. Uh, that was this off season, this off no, that was this off season. He took the 
pay cut? Yeah. I thought it was because I, I thought I remembered it like being exactly like the pay cut that he took exactly was Thomas Brown's contract at the start of last season. But anyway, so we've seen him do that before. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if that was, you know, a conversation that was had. Uh, but also, let's see, Eli Drinkwitz has done it at Missouri. But other than that, it feels like these coaches of South Carolina are now sort of on the forefront of what we'll probably we'll probably see a lot more of. Uh, but I, I think it's a good look for South Carolina that that these three are sort of uh, on the forefront of that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, you if you're a South Carolina fan, for, forget for a moment any anything on the field. you you got to be, I, I think, happy that you have a coach who has um, done what he can to, to sort of help the community in this uh, in this situation. Obviously, we saw he and Carol with the, uh, you know, the Feed Our Heroes Foundation and just um, every time Muschamp talks, he starts by, thanking you know all the doctors nurses first responders and everybody involved so i think you you know if you're a fan or you know somebody who graduated from south carolina or a student you've got to be impressed with how your coach has handled um what is a obviously a, a very odd situation and, and a new situation for all of us i i will uh, i will say real quick like what i'm about to say does not reflect uh, the opinion of gamecock central or 107.5 or anybody this is just my personal opinion and it's not a bad thing um but obviously we know Will Muschamp's on the hot seat, and frankly he should be because there are some things that he needs to figure out as a head coach or you know do to get out of his own way or whatever. Uh, but we'll, all the interactions that I've had with him, which is certainly fewer than the two of you, you know, I can probably count on two hands the amount of times that I've you know had a conversation with him in any capacity. But I've always really liked Will Muschamp. Like he's he's an interesting guy. He's an engaging guy. After having met him a couple times, it was never any more a mystery to me that he was good on the recruiting trail because he's just you know pretty good in a in a one on one kind of setting I, I really like him and stuff like this just reinforces that like I really would like for him to succeed I would like for him to get out of his own way and quit punting on fourth and one from the plus 40 and just go win some football games because I, I do like him and I would like to see him be successful um, and I you know obviously he's uh, really up uh, on the clock here with this last season and a lot of unusual circumstances with a lot of roster turnover and the COVID-19 shutdown and, and things like that but i I don't know. Like he, he does a lot of stuff like this and he's not the only coach that gets involved with this community and, you know, gives money to good causes and stuff like that. But I just wanted to voice that um, again, maybe he's not the best head coach. Maybe his destiny is to be an overqualified defensive coordinator and, you know, amazing recruiter. But I just, I do like Will Muschamp as a person. And this confirms that for me. Well, I mean, when you, when you look at Muschamp, I mean, uh, you know, and time will tell. He's done a lot of good things in South Carolina, and you're right. they got to win some games this year, and if they do, I think they can get back on track, and who knows how much success they can have. I mean, we, we've seen we've seen a lot of coaches start out like gangbusters, and then they fizzle out, or we've seen a lot of coaches uh, not get off to a good start, and then they go on and do really good things. And to some degree, it's a little bit hard to predict. Um, so, yeah, I mean, time will tell on that part of it, but there's no doubt that, I mean, Muschamp, wherever he's been, has been extremely well-liked. I mean, you think back to Florida, and it didn't work out there at the end. But, I mean, his going-away press conference, I mean, you had the president and, and Jeremy Foley, the athletic director at the time over there, just absolutely raving about him. Um, you know, the president back then at Florida, uh, Dr. Bernie Mashin, Mashin, I can't remember how you say the name, I mean, has always vouched for him, um, and, and he's extremely well-liked at South Carolina in the athletic department, and he's a likable person. You're right. And, and, you know, this is this is one of the things. I think a lot of people get caught up and, you know, they see the clips of Will Muschamp on the sideline being intense or, you know, maybe uh, his press conference demeanor. They pick out not the lighthearted moments, but when he's a little bit more serious or something, and they pick those things out. But that's really – the people who really know him behind the scenes know his personality and, and just absolutely love him. I know Wes and I have talked to enough people that know Will Muschamp really well that just it's like it's like they would go to war for him. You know, it's it's really interesting. So um Yeah, very, I mean listening to his former person. players and you know, former assistants yeah. talk about him. I mean it's it's all it's it, it, he's got a you know, pretty, pretty high approval rating considering he has, uh, I'll just say mixed results as a head coach. But anyway, I don't mean this to be like a, like a fluff thing. And I, I don't, I don't think he'll hear this. I don't care if he hears this. I have no, like, I have no dog in the fight. I'm only saying this because it's just, uh, when you see stories like this, and again, you know, same thing for Frank Martin, a lot of people will see him on the sideline and be like, wow, that's the scariest, meanest dude on planet earth. But actually, you know, he's, he's much more than that. And people that obviously follow him and have spent any time, 
you know, with Frank Martin or, or just listening to his press conferences, understand a lot more of what he's all about. And, you know, same thing for Don Staley. We know exactly what she's all about um, in terms of being involved in the community and giving back and things like that. But uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's a good look. And I, I appreciate and I, as I'm sure the two of you do as well, that we follow and work with uh, these coaches that are like ultimately good and likable people. You know, it's, it's not like it would be really hard to to like be on the beat or follow like Urban Meyer because you're like, ugh, everything about this just sucks because this guy just sucks and it's icky and it's gross. But it, it feels good to to, to be, uh, I guess, following coaches that are, you know, good people, fun people to talk to, interesting people, and uh, we'll take voluntary pay cuts like this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Okay, all right, bye. Thanks for listening. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't know. I don't mean to be sappy in this on like a whatever note. But anyway, just uh, wanted to mention that uh, as those coaches are taking pay cuts and saving the university some money as they try to keep everything afloat. So um, that's cool. Appreciate it, guys. Makes it uh, makes it great for for everybody else or something. I don't know. I, I don't know how to end this now. I feel like I'm being awkward. Uh, but anyway, thanks for listening. Rate, review, subscribe to the podcast. Wes and Chris, do you want to say something to save me from my awkwardness here? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Go go for it, Chris. I was going to say free stuff on Gamecock Central. Yes. Free uh, free subscription time. Gamecocks 2020 uh, mm-hmm. is still live. That's our promo code, Gamecocks 2020. If you visit the front page of GamecockCentral.com on your computer, on your phone, there's a banner there. Or if you just click on any premium story and you want to subscribe, that'll get you in free until August. Until the beginning of August, so you can read all of my, our material. There's no downside. If you do not like us at that point, you can cancel. But we think that you'll like the content. You'll like us enough to hang around, come ask us questions on the Insiders Forum, get access to all our content. There's still a lot going on, believe it or not. We've been busy. And so uh, plenty of content to read if you want to come check us out. Subscribe to GameCockCenter.com. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. I'm looking at the front page right now, and there's nothing that's over a day old on, on the front page. So there you go to exactly your point, Chris, I- including – uh, for those of you that are basketball fans, obviously we mostly talk about football in this podcast, but it looks like Colin Taylor just about an hour ago has published an interview he did with uh, Chuck Martin and Bruce Shingler, obviously South Carolina men's basketball assistant coaches talking about sort of the state of the program. So all sorts of stuff. It's current, it's recruiting, it's football, it's basketball, baseball, everything that you want to know, GamecockCentral.com. You were going to say something, Wes? Yeah, I was going to say, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube as well. Um, that is completely free at all times. Uh you know, just search for Gamecock Central on YouTube, hit the subscribe button so that you'll get alerts when we have content because we've, uh, I think we've put out more YouTube content than we ever have before. We've expanded that. It used to just sort of be, you know, interviews and stuff like that and mainly the coaches talking, but we've, uh, for the most part during the week, we've had, had daily content now. So we're going to continue to do that and uh, are hoping to, to grow that page as well. So check us out on YouTube. There you go. YouTube, GamecockCentral.com, the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. Great review. Subscribe to all of that. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week.